Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, invites you to be the informed patient with the podcast that features experts from Central New York's only academic medical center. I'm your host, Amber Smith. Some people with dementia lose their personal warmth and social interests, and they stop responding to the feelings of others. They lose their empathy. But why? I'm talking with one researcher who tackled that question. Hannah Phillips is a postdoctoral associate leading graduate students in Dr. Wei Dong Yao's lab at Upstate. Welcome to The Informed Patient, Dr. Phillips. Hi, thank you for having me. You and your team are studying why patients who develop dementia suffer a loss of empathy. Let me first ask you to tell us what that looks like in patients. Empathy is the ability to share the feelings of others and to adopt, really to adopt another's sensory and emotional state. Uh, and it plays fundamental roles in one's well-being and kinship, uh, our emotional and social lives. It's an important contributor to successful social interactions, enabling us not only to communicate and interact with each other in effective ways, but also to predict uh, the actions and intentions and feelings of others. Is there a way that it's measured so that you can say this person has this much empathy and this person has that much? I should disclose, I'm not a clinician, <laughs> not a medical doctor, but based on you know my understanding of, of the literature and, and how it's measured in patients, uh, basically clinicians rely on, I think in children, they rely a lot on, on reports of others, like caretakers, but often in an adults, uh, they administer various questionnaires that are associated with a specific empathy scales, uh, which is called behavioral scoring. And that's how they, they look at empathy in patients. Does everyone who develops dementia lose empathy? Not necessarily. Dementia is more of an umbrella term. There's many subtypes of dementia that are defined based on the clinical features that appear first and most prominently. It depends mostly on the location of the degeneration, the region of the brain responsible for empathy. If there's specific atrophy to that region, then the patient will ultimately lose or have a progressive loss of empathy. Now, one of those types of dementia, the frontotemporal lobe dementia, can you kind of describe that for us in comparison with Alzheimer's? The, the most unique feature that, that sets the two apart is the early onset of FTD. It is considered the number one cause of pre-senile dementia. So this means that it affects individuals primarily between the ages of 45 and 65, whereas Alzheimer's disease is the number one cause of dementia for individuals over the age of 65. Um, also, you know, as I mentioned, the areas of the brain that are affected uh, first and most prominently are, are different between different types of dementia, which gives rise to these different behavioral patterns that we see. So with Alzheimer's disease, very early on, there's a loss of, of memory and cognitive function. With frontotemporal dementia, we see these hallmark patterns um, that include the loss of empathy and, and social behaviors and, and eating habits early on. And it's more so in later disease stages that there's a loss of, of memory. So the loss of empathy may be an early symptom of FTD? Yeah, that's correct. It, it is considered one of the more early to mid-stage behavioral symptoms of FTD. Well, please tell us about your work that was published in the journal Neuron. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, we're very excited about this study that just came out. We basically, for this, this story, we first set out to develop a mouse paradigm of empathy so that we could, we could study it. We, we developed one that captures two forms of empathy, uh, both emotional contagion, which is a basic form of affective empathy, and distress-induced other-directed consolation or comforting, which is an empathy-driven prosocial behavior that was actually initially observed in the highly social monogamous rodent species prairie vole. And so we, after we had established this, this paradigm of empathy, we then established a mouse model deficient in empathy and observed that these aged somatic transgenic mice that are expressing a G4C2 repeat expansion in the C9ORF72 gene, which is the most common gene risk of FTD, 
And we found that these mice at about 12, 12 months old exhibited a blunted emotional contagion and they failed to console distressed conspecifics by affiliative contact. And then further, we found that this distress-induced comforting behavior specifically activated a region of the brain called the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex. And further, we found that mutant neurons in the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex fire significantly less action potentials compared to healthy control neurons from healthy control mice at the same age, indicating that there is indeed profound pyramidal neuron hypo excitability in these aged mutant mice at a late disease stage. And most importantly, is that we showed that chemogenetically enhancing this region of the brain, the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, uh, by enhancing the excitability in this brain region, we could rescue empathy deficits in the mutant mice, even at advanced stages where we saw substantial cortical atrophy or neurodegeneration had occurred. So these results were very exciting because they established cortical hypoexcitability as a new a novel pathophysiological basis of empathy loss in FTD um, and also suggests that enhancing the activity of the frontotemporal cortex um, may serve as a viable therapeutic strategy for BVFTD, uh, for which there are currently no approved and few effective treatments. I want to ask you a lot more about that, but let me get back to, I'm still kind of s struck with these mice. So you were able to create mice that lacked empathy, essentially, compared to mice that have empathy. I guess I never even thought of mice having empathy. Um, did they behave differently it, side by side in cages? Yes. Yeah, they did. And it's, you know, empathy is an, a behavior that classically we think of only in humans um, or historically it's considered, you know, a process experienced solely by humans. But more recently, it, it's becoming appreciated that many species, including rodents, display what evolutionarily conserve behavioral antecedents of empathy or these more primitive forms of empathy. Um, such as emotional contagion, which uh, in our case, we, we uh, looked at the social transfer of fear or observational fear. Also, consolation and social buffering of stress and, and even helping and sharing has been shown in rodents and now in mice. And that's what we saw with this, this disease model is that in these mice that harbor these, these repeat expansions, um, which, as I mentioned, is, is the most common gene or familial cause of FTD, um, side by side, they they show significantly less emotional contagion or or this this fear related response when during the observational fear task, and also empathy or comforting related behaviors. And in our case, we looked at like body touching and allo grooming or grooming the other mouse to comfort it. But we found significantly less of these behaviors in the mutant mouse compared to the control mouse at the same age. So it was very striking. And did you say that the brain cells were less active in the early stages of disease? So this is actually more of a late disease stage model, um, mid to late, because these mice are 12 months old, which is equivalent to about 45 to 50 human years. And yeah, so we, we consider this more mid to late disease stage, uh, the, the mouse model they were using. And we found that the, the mutant neurons in the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex of these mice fire significantly less action potentials, almost half the amount of action potentials compared to controls. So they're less excitable. This is Upstate's The Informed Patient podcast. I'm your host, Amber Smith, talking with Dr. Hannah Phillips. She leads a team of graduate students in the laboratory of Dr. Weidong Yao at Upstate, and their research about loss of empathy in frontotemporal dementia was published recently in the journal Neuron. So let's talk about how brain cells can be made to be more active, because that's sort of, we're on the cusp of wanting to be able to do that, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So 
In patients, I mean, again, I'm not a, a clinician or a medical doctor, but based on my understanding, so there's there's a couple different types of um, approaches that can be used to manipulate brain activity that include transcranial magnetic stimulation and then deep brain stimulation is very commonly used. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is more of a non-invasive form of brain stimulation, whereas deep brain stimulation is an invasive procedure where they implant these electrodes into certain areas of the brain that produce electrical impulses to regulate abnormal brain activity. This is a very exciting potential approach to be used for for you know disease diseases where there's changes in in activity in the brain, but we need to work with clinicians because any of these techniques, although very powerful, can affect many brain cells. And the goal is really more to to target those disease neurons specifically. And even though that's the hope and the potential at these stages, there's still a lot of work to be done to figure out how to apply this to modulate brain activity and reduce like potential side effects. But in theory, if we can increase brain activity, then we could ultimately alleviate these empathy deficits. However, when you actually do it in patients, it's obviously much more complicated. So there's a lot of work still to be done, but it's a very exciting forefront. So. Well, I understand you're starting a fellowship at Harvard University soon. Do you expect that you'll continue focusing your research on frontotemporal lobe dementia? Uh, I won't be working on, on FTD here, but uh, I, I will still be studying the neural mechanisms of social behaviors and social impairments, so I'm very excited about that. And my goal and hope one day is to have my own lab, and I would be very excited to continue researching the neural mechanisms of FTD and hopefully make significant contributions to the field and towards new and effective therapies. Well, thank you so much for making time for this interview, Dr. Phillips. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. My guest has been Dr. Hannah Phillips, a postdoctoral associate in Dr. Wei Dong Yao's laboratory at Upstate. The Informed Patient is a podcast covering health, science, and medicine, brought to you by Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, and produced by Jim Howe, Find our archive of previous episodes at upstate.edu informed. This is your host, Amber Smith, thanking you for listening.